Um, so my name is Amanda and I work at the Heinz History Center. I'm here with Jocelyn, who also works at the Heinz History Center. And you might notice Laura is with us as well. Laura will be answering things um, in the chat and in the Q&A a lot. So if you see Laura's name in there, she works with us at the History Center as well. We are presenting this as a webinar, so we cannot see or hear you. Um, you can talk to us, though, by using the chat and the Q&A features that you will see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the chat will just come to us. The Q&A, we will, uh, those also just come to us. And when we answer questions by um, typing them or answering them out loud, we might put those into the Q&A so that everyone can see the questions and answers that are coming through. Uh, because sometimes people ask really great questions and we want to share that knowledge with all of you. Um, so you can put any comments or questions you have as we go through in the chat and the Q&A. And this is our last of our uh, Black History Month series of school programs that we've been doing. So this one is all about Pittsburgh and the civil rights movement. And so if you've been with us through all four weeks of this, this is sort of the end part of the story that we are, uh, that we are telling or at least up until mostly today. Um, and uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen here and get us started. And then Jocelyn and I will kind of trade back and forth on uh, presenting today. And like I said, Laura is keeping an eye on the rest of it for us. Um, uh, Laura, anything we should cover before we get started? Anything popping up there already? Um, just a reminder that if you wanna ask us a question that you would, you would rather we didn't share with everyone, just throw a little note in there that says, can you just answer it to me privately? That's something I can do. And mostly I do that unless it's a question that I think everyone should hear the answer to. So glad you're joining us today. Great. Thanks, Laura. Yes, we're very glad that everyone is joining us uh, this afternoon. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, I am going to get my screen share up and running. Okay. That should be looking right. So as I said, we're talking all about Pittsburgh and the civil rights movement today. And we're gonna start off by talking about one specific person who's very important to the sort of early days of that story here in Western Pennsylvania. And her name is Daisy Lampkin. And so you see the photograph that I've put up there has three women uh, standing uh, together and the lady in the middle has this big beautiful hat on and this big beautiful bouquet of flowers. And that lady in the middle there is Daisy Lampkin. Um, she is a person who was really important to a few different movements in Pittsburgh that we could consider part of the civil rights movement. So she came here to Pittsburgh in 1909 and she got married here in 1912. And so if you were with us last week, we talked a lot about the Great Migration when African American people were moving from the South into these northern industrial cities like Pittsburgh. Daisy Lampkin didn't come as part of that movement. She came here a little bit before it. Um, but once she was here, she ended up helping a lot of those people who did come as part of the Great Migration. So once she gets married in 1912, she starts working with lots of other African-American women, um, some of them housewives, all coming together um, and being organized under Daisy Lampkin to fight for racial and gender equality. So first she starts working on the suffrage movement. So she was a suffragist, um, so that, um, that movement to get women the right to vote. So when Daisy Lampkin first starts doing her work, uh, women did not have the right to vote in the United States, and she was an instrumental part of the local suffrage movement, women working here uh, to get women the right to vote. Once that had been achieved, Daisy Lampkin did not feel that the work was done, and she shifted her focus to focusing more on civil rights. Um, so she started working on rights for African American people. And as part of that work, Daisy Lampkin became really important in a lot of different local organizations that were stepping up to help people who had come here as part of the Great Migration. So if you were with us last week and we talked a little bit about the Urban League, that is one of the organizations that came here to Pittsburgh to help people and Daisy Lampkin was very involved in the local branch of the Urban League. She also became involved in the NAACP, which is an organization that still today works uh, 
works on uh, rights for African American people and a whole bunch of different local uh, organizations. She then became really important in the national scene of those organizations. Daisy Lampkin was a very good speaker. People really liked her. She worked really, really hard at, um, at, at these, uh, these movements. And so there was a point in her career where she was so important that she was being welcomed into meetings where she was surrounded by all of these other sort of black leaders who were men and the president of the United States of America. And she was the only woman present. And that gives us a real sense of the importance of, of Daisy Lampkin and how uh, influential she was. So she started out with these local groups. She grew to be important to these groups nationally. And one thing that she worked on that we also sort of touched on last week is the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper. And so this is a black owned newspaper that had black journalists. It was published here in Pittsburgh. But during World War II, um, and maybe a little bit before, the newspaper became really, really important all over the country. So it starts being printed and, and sent all over the place um, to lots of different Black people who want to know the news about their communities. So it might tell stories about things that are happening here in Pittsburgh, but also things that are happening in Black communities all over the country. And for 35 years of the Pittsburgh Courier, Daisy Lampkin was vice president. She was very involved in the paper. She sometimes worked as editor. She sometimes wrote articles for the newspaper. And it was under her term as vice president that the newspaper grew to be something really, really important all over the country. And I'm gonna put up a picture here of something that um, came out of the Pittsburgh Courier that helps us to kick off our story talking about civil rights. And that is this. Now, some of you may be familiar with this already, and you may have seen this before, but I wonder if you can put into the chat or the Q&A uh, what you see in this picture. What do you think this is trying to tell us? What is this about? Let's see what people think. See, can anyone tell us in the chat what they think this picture is about? I'll give you a hint. It was first, it first appeared in the Pittsburgh Courier in 1942. Someone saying that democracy won twice. Okay, yeah, so we see this like double victory here. Something about democracy winning twice. Absolutely. A lot of people picking on the um, democracy W victory at home and abroad. Yes, yeah, so we see that victory at home and abroad. Very good. Someone says they think it's about coming together, a final win. Mm -hmm. Victory yeah. in World War II. It is about victory in World War II. Very good, very good. Yes. Someone says the flag of her survivals. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but that'd be interesting to get a little bit of elaboration yeah. on. Yeah. Black people use it for equal rights. It does have to do with equal rights, absolutely. And then right following that has something to do with keeping democracy abroad during World War II. Uh -huh. Yes. And I so, think we're all on the right track. Yeah, absolutely. We are all on the right track. And so when we look at this poster, uh, again, from 1942, uh, from the Courier, we can see it says democracy. We all picked up on this idea of victory. Can you see that there are two V's here? Uh, this is called the double V campaign. And it is something that the Courier and other newspapers used to try to encourage Americans to think a little bit deeper about what was going on in World War II and what was going on in the United States in the 1940s. So in the South in the 1940s, there were Jim Crow laws, black and white people were segregated by law. In the North, as we'll learn, people were still sort of segregated even if it wasn't by law. And during World War II, people were being asked to go and fight in Europe 
against white supremacy, against the Nazis who thought that they were better than some other people in Europe. And when, uh, especially if African Americans were going and fighting in that war, when they were coming home and seeing that that was still sort of happening here, there were white supremacist people who thought that they were better and they were trying to keep black people out of almost everything that they could, especially in the South. And so this double V campaign is encouraging people to think about how we need victory abroad over the Nazis, but we also need victory at home over Jim Crow laws, over segregation and things like that. So it's calling for democracy in, on both sides of that, democracy abroad, but also democracy at home, where people need to be included in the process and have a say in what's going on in this country. And so that is something that the Courier was pushing, lots of other newspapers um, sort of jumped onto that and were sharing it as well. And um, Daisy Lampkin, actually the next picture that I have here, um, the lady standing in the middle of this photograph, so there's a, a man and then a woman and then another man, and Daisy Lampkin in the middle has this V for victory at home and V for victory abroad poster that she's holding there. Um, so that's part of her work with the NAACP nationally. That's from the St. Louis branch. But um, she's kind of sharing this message that the newspaper is sharing in other ways as well. And that kind of helps set us up uh, for something that we're going to talk about in just a moment. But are there any questions or things we should address there before we move on to our next section? Yeah, I think there's some great questions in the Q&A. Um, so first of all, so what are Jim Crow laws? So that's touching on uh -huh. what we talked about last week. But. Yes, yes. So uh, we did cover that a lot last week and that person must not have been there for that. So I will go into it a little bit. Um, so Jim Crow laws were in place in the South of the United States uh, from the end of reconstruction. So about 1877, really up until the 1960s when the civil rights movement was in full swing and got some legislation passed that, that ended them. And what Jim Crow laws basically did is they were, uh, they were state laws, so different states had different laws. Some of them were even more local than that. And they were basically ways to legally segregate black people from white people. And so it would be illegal, for instance, for um, black and white people to uh, sit in certain parts of a bus or something like that, or maybe even share the same bus. It would be illegal for black and white people to use the same facilities in a building like restrooms and things like that. And so um, it kept people very purposefully separate. And that was by law, not just by sort of attitude. It was legal separation. Um, so what tactics did Daisy Lambkin use to fight for women and also for African Americans? Oh, that's a big one because there are so many different things that, I mean, we could do an entire program on just Daisy Lampkin really. Um, so a lot of her, her tactics were organizing people to come together and work on something. So um, if they needed people to come out and support the uh, women's suffrage movement, the women's right to vote, Daisy Lampkin was a person who could bring lots of people together and encourage them to show up for these, um, these movements. Um, but I encourage you to look up a lot more about Daisy Lampkin. There's just so much, her life is full of tactics and things that she was able to accomplish in terms of civil rights and women's suffrage. So it might be too hard to get super into that. And there's also a question about the picture carrier, which I think is something that's really important. Did the paper have a bias? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I guess, I don't know. What do you think, Jocelyn? Do you have an answer there? I think it definitely had a bias as all newspapers did at the time, depending on who's producing it. It was definitely focused on uploading, uplifting black people and telling black stories. So from the people that created it being African-Americans to the people that really distributed it and read it. So naturally, I think it had that bias of telling stories that were important to African-Americans and telling information that were, were what that was important for them to know. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Anything else there before I touch on this last thing before I hand it over to you? Uh, there's just a few more about symbols and double V campaigns about the eagle, which is just an American symbol. Yes. And 
this idea of white supremacy when we mentioned the Nazis in World War II. So like the idea of how whiteness is defined differently in different parts of the world and throughout history. Yeah. So the question was, were Nazis really fighting for white supremacy? Hmm. I, I mean, I would, I think you got to it there, Jocelyn, in that idea of like whiteness has just been defined differently depending on when you're talking about and what part of the world you're talking about. Um, I mean, I would argue that that's what it was about, but that's also a complicated, we could do a whole program on that too. <laughs> yeah, just for sake of time, I think we'll move on to the next part. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, but we'll continue to answer questions behind the scenes. Yes, thank you. Okay, so one last little bit that I want to touch on that kind of goes along with what we were talking about in terms of the Jim Crow laws and things like that. And this is kind of helping us to understand what Jocelyn is going to share with us in a moment here. Uh, but I want to sort of set the scene here for what the situation was in the North as it relates to uh, segregation. And so in the South, we had Jim Crow laws where Black people and white people were legally separated. There were laws in place that kept people separated. In Pennsylvania and in other Northern states, there were often laws that said the opposite, that it was illegal to separate people in public spaces. Um, so Pennsylvania had a law as of 1935, and it had a law before that that kind of got into some of this too, uh, but basically it meant that segregating a public space was, was illegal, it was not okay. But that doesn't mean it didn't happen. And so there were still places where Black people were not welcome in Pennsylvania and in Pittsburgh. And that was mostly because of the attitudes of the white people who might have been in charge of those spaces, purposefully excluding Black people by making them unwelcome in various ways. And so, um, you know, there might be businesses that are more friendly to African-American people and businesses that absolutely are not. And uh, this makes things really difficult for civil rights activists in the North. And I say it wasn't as simple as changing a law. Changing a law is not simple, but it was actually even harder than that to change the attitudes of people who had grown up in a world where people were purposefully kept separate. And so that's something that Jocelyn is going to get into here uh, in the example that she is going to share with us. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share so Jocelyn can start hers. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Jocelyn. Great. Let's start sharing my screen. So I think you really left out on a perfect part to go into the story about something that a lot of people probably don't think about when they're thinking of the North, and that's swimming pools. So for this case, we are going to focus on the Highland Park Swimming Pool, which opened in 1931. Um, so this was the first mixed gender swimming pool in the city. It was huge. It could fit up to 10,000 people. It cost more than one, 1,200, not 1,000, $120,000 to make, and it was city owned. Previously before this, a lot of swimming facilities and bathhouses, they did have black people and white people using them both, but they were separated by gender. So this idea of gender mixing and race mixing caused a very huge issue. It was at this point where people were like, okay, it was one thing to swim with different races when we were all the same gender, but now that there's different genders, we don't want to share a facility with you. So that really gets into the idea of all the prejudices held against black people as being aggressive and like sexually promiscuous. But so when Highland Park Swimming Pool opened from the very beginning, it had issues with segregation. The very first year was open four days after it. This headline up here in the corner saying, denied segregation at Highland Park Swimming Pool, but Negroes are beaten while cops look on. So this idea of a public space that is city owned that was paid for with city tax dollars being denied to the citizens that helped pay for it just based on their skin color was ridiculous. And just by easily looking up every single year, I could find at least one instance of this happening. So all of these headlines and newspaper clippings are all from different years, all mentioning Highland Park swimming pool cases where people are beaten while cops look on, 
or pushed out of the facility by the white people that use it. So because of the violence and threats that were often lobbied against African-Americans that tried to use the Highland Park swimming pool and other facilities that were majorly used by white citizens of Pittsburgh, Black people were often made forced to use less older facilities that weren't kept up well, such as Sully's Pool in South Hills, as well as a pool about a, a few blocks away on Washington Boulevard. And these facilities were much smaller. They didn't have the same hours and they also didn't always allow mixed gender swimming. So because of the amount of people that wanted to use them and enjoy this, their facilities, they often couldn't meet that capacity. So throughout the years, people tried to continuously break this color barrier at Highland Park Swimming Pool. And one of those instances in 1945, 25 teenagers from Good Hope Baptist Church decided they were going to go and stage a swim in. They went to Highland Park Swimming Pool and immediately as soon as they entered the water, they were surrounded by a group of people who shouted insults and threatened them. They did what anyone would naturally do and turned to police officers that were stationed there, but they were ignored. Because of the threats, they had to leave or they were going to face violence. During this instance, someone witnessed it and her name was Dorothy Sloan. And this is the letter that she wrote to the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette stating that the cops did nothing to protect the rights of Negro people to swim in our city pool. They stood around with their arms folded. 1945 was a very important year for the United States of America. As Amanda previously mentioned, World War II, this was the year that was coming to an end. So many people like Dorothy began to question American ideals of and how the nation treated racial minorities and the citizens specifically when it came to racial discrimination. So she goes on in her letter to say that Freedom of all people was something that we fought for during the war, but freedom can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And one of them is the right to choose where you go to swim. And she goes on to say that this idea of keeping people out of a space based on their color is un-American. So she really began to fight, well, people really began to stand up against this idea of white supremacy in their homeland and believe that I might not totally agree with mixing races and I might not want to do it, but it's something that our country is founded on and it's something that we have to accept. And this idea of people fighting in the war at home and then coming home and not gaining full rights is something that also bled into this desegregation of the Highland Park swimming pool. So in this image, you can see protesters holding signs, one of them saying, we want democracy at Highland Park Pool. Mayor Lawrence, what do you want? So that's basically saying, if we're fighting for democracy abroad, why can't we have democracy and embrace democracy in our own city? And then in the background, you also see this man back here. We fought together, why can't we swim together? So that idea of, we were willing to shed our blood and be injured for this country, but when we come home, we still can't celebrate or have equal rights in our own home. So this idea, these protests happen throughout the years. 1948, a whole group of people go to the Highland Park Swimming Pool of mixed race, and they're met by hundreds of white people that really feel strongly about holding that color line at Highland Park Swimming Pool. Most of them were arrested and they had to go to court. And this is a picture of all of them standing in the background waiting to face the judge. And the thing about this case that happened is a few days later in the paper where the people speak back, so that's where the people would write letters to the newspaper, we have two opposing views. We have one lady saying, I for one am up in arms over the way the Wallace Progressive Party is deliberately trying to create race riots. So that was the name of one of the organiz organizations that staged this series of protests. And then on the other hand, you have a member of that party fighting back and saying, 
it's not enough for administration to make these statements on high ground policy. It's only when the action is taken to enforce those policies that it even matters. So if the city's not gonna fight for our rights, they're gonna fight for it and they're going to continue to fight and break Jim Crow practices in Pittsburgh. So it's basically re recanting the idea of segregation in Pittsburgh is something that is frankly illegal and the practice here shouldn't continue at all. It wasn't until 1951, 20 years after the Highland Park swimming pool opened that this practice of segregation came to an end. This man right in the middle is Alexander Allen. He was the executive secretary of the Urban League of Pittsburgh. And he decided that he was going to test the accessibility of the pool. And if he, as a black man, could go to the pool and enjoy this public city owned facility. When he went, he was of course immediately surrounded by white teenagers that insulted him and ejected him from the pool. He, like any respectable adult, turned to the police. And the police said, you have the perfect right to enjoy this pool, but we will not protect you. So the NCAA filed a lawsuit against the city, Mayor Lawrence and public safety officials saying that you're failing to, protect, to provide enough protection to the citizens to enjoy a public facility. And this suit sought to get the Highland Park swimming pool closed down. During this case, they said, okay, we'll wait until the end of summer and see if any of this has changed. So by the end of summer, Mayor Lawrence said to the police, you have to protect every single black person that goes to this pool. And as easy as that was, it worked. And it ended up staying open and the NCAA dropped the case. Although it was a victory for Highland Park swimming pool, it wasn't a victory for Pittsburgh because this practice of segregations at swimming pools throughout the city continued. And the city found ways to go around it by saying that if you go to a certain, if you live in a certain neighborhood, you can only go to this pool by making facilities private, so joining different swimming clubs. Although it was a small victory, this was a fight that still had to continue throughout our city over the years. And from here, I will pass it back to Amanda to tell a story about people going out of Pittsburgh during the civil rights movement making a change. While we change over, were there any questions about Highland Park swimming pool or the desegregation of it? So there was a question in the chat about whether there were black businesses, black owned businesses that use tax tactics to keep white citizens out in the same way that we saw the reverse. Um, if that makes sense. That does make a lot of sense. And as far as I know, no, I've never heard of a black business excluding white people from visiting it, anything, they relied on a lot of white businesses because those were the people that held wealth in the city. Um, so if you look at places like entertainment, places like the Negro League baseball teams and different clubs, just different jazz clubs that were black establishments, they clearly welcomed white citizens because they were very much coming into the black community. We've got another question here, which I think is a great one. Um, is this why it's stereotyped that Black people can't swim? Where did that stereotype originate? That is a great question. And I feel as though it probably originated from instances like this, where Black people were often afraid to go swimming because of violence that was going to be lobbied against them. And yeah, simply not allowed, right? Just like excluded from, yeah. I would bet there's a connection there. Okay, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move us on. We have a lot to cover. So um, I'm going to um, share my screen again here and talk a little bit about one important part of this story that I think is, is good to cover, um, which is the Freedom Summer, which uh, happened in 1964. And so this is a story that is mostly about Mississippi, but there's a very clear Pittsburgh connection that I'll get to. Um, and so in 1964, um, a lot of um, 
particularly white college students, went down to uh, Mississippi in order to try to help Black voters register to vote. And um, the idea behind that was that Mississippi was one of the worst states for what we call voter disenfranchisement. And so while Black people had the right to vote, uh, according to the Constitution, once that right had been cemented in the Constitution, lots and lots of other laws, like those Jim Crow laws, popped up in the South to try to prevent them from actually exercising that right. Mississippi is one of the worst states for that um, back in the 60s and then even before. They would have something like uh, maybe a poll tax that people had to pay in order to vote. A lot of uh, Black people in Mississippi might have been sharecroppers or people living uh, with very little disposable income and they might not have been able to pay that money. Also, poll taxes were very complicated. Um, you only had to pay them on certain years, maybe, and there were a lot of rules you had to follow about it. They might have also had residency requirements that made it that people had to live in the same house for maybe a year or, or maybe in the same town for so long before they could get the ability to vote there. So all these different considerations uh, that were uh, made purposefully to stop Black people from being able to vote. So in 1964, at the start of it, only about 6% of people in Mississippi, of Black people in Mississippi who were eligible to vote were actually registered and voting. And so it was recognized that uh, that's a big problem if there's a huge section of your community that is not exercising their right to vote. It means not everyone is represented. And so um, some people in the North were organized by various student groups that were prominent during the civil rights movement um, to go down to Mississippi as part of the Freedom Summer and register Black people to vote. They also uh, participated in freedom schools where they would provide education about voting, education about Black history, things like that, that people in the South were not being taught in school. And so uh, some Pittsburgh local people went down there to do this. They were risking a lot in doing this because in Mississippi, white people who did not want Black people to vote were not happy about Northerners coming into their state and trying to shake things up. And so they faced violence. Um, some people were actually killed for doing this. Um, so what they did was really important and, and very risky. And so one of those people um, who did that from Pittsburgh is this lady here whose name was Gail Falk. And you may know the name Falk if you've been around Pittsburgh for a while. That's a very prominent Pittsburgh family. Their name is on all kinds of things in the city. And Gail Falk was about 20 years old. She was a college student. She came from Squirrel Hill and uh, obviously came from a very wealthy family. And she's one of the people who participated in the Freedom Summer. So she went down to Mississippi and uh, worked on helping Black people get registered to vote. And the reason that people like Gail Falk um, thought it was important that they do this is because if they are coming from a wealthy family and they are white, uh, and they are from the North, the consequences of what could happen to them in the South might have been a little bit less than for other people. So if Gail Falk were to get arrested for what she was doing in the South, you know, she knows that her family has money to pay her bail, they have lawyers to help her out. So they're almost kind of like using their privilege to help people in the South uh, who needed their help. And so um, Gail Falk is one of these people. There were lots of other Pittsburghers who went out and did that. Um, Donald Hamer, uh, Robert Lavelle Jr. is a person who gets talked about a lot in this story, a very prominent Pittsburgher as well. Um, and some people who were students at universities here in Pittsburgh also participated. And so this was quite organized and coordinated, right? This says they went to a week of orientation at what is now Miami University in Ohio before they went down. Um, so they were all on the same page about what they were trying to achieve in Mississippi. And once they had done all of that, um, they registered lots and lots of people to vote. They came back to um, Pittsburgh or wherever they had come from. And this little news article uh, is about how people gathered to hear these civil rights workers from the Freedom Summer talk about what they went through. 
Um, and so the mayor has, uh, the mayor actually showed up to this meeting as a surprise. He kind of tried to sneak in, um, but obviously people recognized the mayor at the time. And so he gave a little impromptu speech about how they had done their job in Mississippi, but they also did their job in Pittsburgh because at that same time, there were a lot of people working here in the city to also register black voters. So it's not like it was just Mississippi. There was this movement to get black people involved in the democratic process more and more in the 1960s as what we think of as the civil rights movement was really gearing up. Um, there were also some local church groups that got involved in it as well and went down to help with voter registration. Um, so a fair number of Pittsburgh people were actually involved in, in the Freedom Summer. And so when we talk about how there was all that you know, Jocelyn telling us about the swimming pool and the segregation and white people trying to keep black people out. There were also some white people who recognized that this was a terrible thing that was happening and were trying to find ways to intervene and, and to make some uh, impact on the problem. So uh, some of those people were right here in Pittsburgh. Um, are there any questions about that before I hand it back to Jocelyn to continue our story or anything we should cover before we move on? Yes. So why were black people denied the right to vote that's a that's a big one that's a good question um and i think it comes back to thinking about um when we are talking about the end of the civil war and reconstruction and black people um trying to find their place in the system and white people not wanting that to happen um it it ends up being that white people in the South in particular realize that if black people start voting, they're gonna vote against the interests of some of those white people. And they're not gonna vote for people who are outright white supremacists like a lot of those politicians maybe were. Um, and so I think the white people in the South who were against all of this see it as a threat to their way of life if black people are fully able to vote. Um, at least that's my take on it. I don't know if you have anything to add, Jocelyn. And I was going to say basically the same thing. If Black people were given the right to vote, politicians would have to start listening to them. Like the whole idea of voting and representation in Southern states have been something that um, white people will have used the population of Black people with like different laws like the three-fifths law to up their representation in government. So they're like using them to count as people, but not using their votes to actually represent them. All right, I'm going to stop my screen share so that you can take it back um, and you can carry on our story. And as Jocelyn's carrying on the story, I will just say that um, we had a comment that just carries forward that idea that Black uh, people are still being denied voting today through different practices. Um, and so that is not a story that has ended, but it looks a little different than it did during the Freedom Summer. That's a really good point with the different laws that say who can vote, who can't vote if you're a convicted felon and over policing and that whole system. That's a whole different story that we could do a different presentation on, but that's a good point. And Jocelyn, okay. sorry, just before you start off, um, there are questions about if people were scared, if black people were scared where they live, why didn't they just move? And did the white people um, that harmed others get punished? So this idea of safety in their community? Mm. Um, that's a complicated question. So it's kind of like what you know. So a lot of people during the Great Migration, they thought the North was this big idea and like this, a place where they were going to find salvation and prosper. And it wasn't necessarily that. And a lot of times people felt more comfortable staying in a place where they knew what they could do and what they couldn't do than venturing off to go to a bigger city. So was that, and also some people didn't have the ability to just get up and leave. There were laws in place and people that oftentimes tried to stop the movement of African-Americans to areas that were safer or more accepting. If that answers that very large question. It does, I'll let you carry on, thanks. Okay, great. So we are going a little bit back in time. So. After World War II, Pittsburgh went under huge renewal pro projects. And these renewal projects really 
caused a lot of a big boom in construction. And so it gave rise to a lot of different construction jobs and made them more accessible to people. But at the time, construction unions were dominated by white and nearly impossible to gain access to if you were African American. So even after protests, they often still wouldn't be able to gain access to it. And that is because many people said that they just did not have the skills to do these jobs. And the thing about these construction jobs are that a lot of them happened in predominantly African-American communities. So if we look at this map on the screen, particularly this area right here, which is what would have been the Lower Hill District, a few years after this picture was taken, it was raised. So this whole area is no longer standing. And it was in here, a Civic Arena was built, if anyone remembers that. Now there's PPG paints. But so this area was totally renovated and it totally the neighborhood was raised. So a lot of the families had to move out of them and go to different places. And they were displaced just to build something, but they weren't included in that construction planning at all. So you see change over here, as well as over on that north side with Three River Stadium and Howling Field and all that. So a lot of the unions, of course, said, Black people just don't have the skills that are needed to be able to join these unions. So in enters this man, Nate Smith who has a very interesting life, which I will not get into right now, but he was one of the few black men that had his union card and had the ability to teach African-Americans how to do these jobs. So he said, I don't see people like me and you're not hiring them because you say they do not have the skills to do these jobs. So I'll teach them. And it was a very successful program. So his Operation Dig program that trained people along with during construction projects was really successful oops, sorry, <laughs> was really successful. But still, unions would not hire African-Americans. And he was like, all right, so you said they didn't have training. I trained them. And now you still won't hire them. So I'm going to disrupt construction. So he organized a group called the Black Construction Coalition. And what they did is they went to different sites that were under construction throughout the city and disrupted them. They protested, they marched past them, they climbed over fences to stop the construction from happening. And this really forced those union bosses and city officials to come to the table. So they put a plan forward and said, this is what we want to happen. And the union bosses and city officials finally said, all right, this is, it could happen and they created something called the Pittsburgh Plan. This was used to ultimately integrate labor unions with the goal of hiring, hiring 1,250 Blacks over a period of four years. So this model of training African-Americans and then integrating them into unions to have construction jobs was something that was implemented in cities throughout the US. And Nate Smith really became a labor activist that not only catapulted labor rights in Pittsburgh, but also throughout the world. So not only was he helping start these programs in other cities, he was also visiting different countries throughout the world and really talking about labor unions and how to properly train people and integrate them so they're more inclusive. And that movement really started at this point that is still standing today, which is at the corner of Center and Crawford Street in the Hill District, which is called Freedom Corner. This is a lot where a lot of those different marches and labor movements started. They would all gather here and they would march throughout the city and then this would be a gathering point for them. This place today is still used as a place of activism. And we still have a lot of activism in Pittsburgh with the goal of black liberation. So these are a few organizations and movements that have happened throughout the years. And then currently, a lot of these different organizations are focusing on police reform. So if you know anything about the summer of 2020 here in Pittsburgh, there were many groups throughout the city that would be protesting against police, police brutality that has happened throughout the United States and is also very prevalent in our city today. So these different groups all came together and a lot of them made protests as well as 
amending list of demands to city officials and the mayor. So this is very much an ongoing struggle for black liberation and it's the story of civil rights is something that is still continuing today. Were there any questions about that very spread up version of the labor movement? You must have explained it very well. I don't see any questions. Yes. Yeah, people must have been paying very, very close attention to uh, yeah. your speaking there. Um, <laughs> no questions so far at all. That is the case. I'm very glad that all of you could join us for these programs. If you've come to all of them, thank you for sticking around. I'm going to share the Kahoot in the chat just in case anyone wants to hop on that. Yes. Um, and yeah, if you have any um, any last questions or anything you want to drop in there, you can go ahead. Um, oh, yeah. I actually see. Wait, is that a recent question? No, that's not a wait. Yes, it is. Oh, um, the question is. It's nice oh. that people want that white people want to help, but why did they why didn't they go along with it at the very beginning? Um, so that's a good question, and I guess I'll try to take it on. Um, so I feel like there's two answers. It's the people that have really benefited from the benefited from racism, discrimination, and really putting people below them in some way, shape, or form. So they do not want to give that power up. And there's also this other argument that some people just didn't witness it. They didn't honestly know that it was that bad. Like, it was just natural for them not to have interactions with Black people. So they didn't understand all the things that they were facing. Like, if you think about it, we are a very highly connected society today and we get a lot of our information from very instantly. Like a thing could happen a minute ago and I could have my cell phone right now through Instagram, through Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Back then you had to really look at the sources that people had. So newspapers, maybe the TV, some radio and who were the people that owned those and what stories were those media sources telling? Yes. And also to add to that, Jocelyn, when people are purposefully separated, like the Jim Crow laws keeping people apart, it was that much harder for any of that communication to happen between black and white people for people to actually understand what was going on. So the longer that process continued, the less and less contact people really had with people from a, a different race to themselves. So I'm definitely not trying to minimize, minimize the fact that there are white people that have purposely done this and continue yeah. this process today. Mm -hmm. But I will state that there are people that were just ignorant. Yeah, yeah, just unaware. Um, I just wanna say that um, in the Q&A, we have a comment that Nate Smith is famous for laying in front of a bulldozer while they were building Three River Stadium. So um, yes, yeah, very disruptive yeah. uh, mm -hmm. to make their point. Nate Smith is definitely a rock star. Like during this research, I've researched him before, but like trying to find images of him, he he's literally meant president. He met the Jackson five. He is yeah. really famous. And it's weird that people don't know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really interesting guy. All right. And, and I did not last that. Yeah. In the chat, someone asked about be, are black people allowed to vote? I think it's important that we say at the end of this, that yes, everyone who can vote should vote. There are no rules that say, the color of your skin decides if you vote or not, but there are tactics that people use to keep some people from getting to the polls or being able to vote. And that's a good clarifying question. Thank you. Yes. And local groups like, um, there's a group called BPEP here in the city and their whole mission is to get black people to vote in every single election from council people all the way to president. Uh, because they recognize that Black people voting is the way that change can be actually affected in a lot of ways. Great question. All right, we need to wrap up. We've gone on for too long. <laughs> um, 
I like I said at the end of the last one this morning, there's so much more to the story of civil rights in Pittsburgh as well. So I encourage you all to do some research if you're interested. Lots and lots of people we wanted to talk about today, but we just simply didn't have time. So um, I hope that you are inspired to do some more research. I thank you for sticking with us. Um, and uh, thank you to Laura for typing away in the chat there. And thank you to Jocelyn. Uh, great job, everyone. All right. No, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you all. And just a note about the people asking about Black people voting. Um, just if there's a few videos out about laws that have happened in the South that are crazy, that give you a better understanding of what the tactics that people really use that would take hours and days to understand. But thank yes, you all we, for coming. We just scratched the surface there, so. <laughs>